really silent. Okay, so um, I just wait to see him. Hello, and welcome to the City Talks. I acknowledge with respect the Lekwungen peoples on whose traditional ter territory the city of Victoria stands, and the Songhees and Esquimalt peoples, whose historical relationship with the land continue to this day. Uh, since this speaker series is partnered with UBIC, I acknowledge as well the Wasanish peoples, even though we're not on their land currently. I'm Alex Darcy, I'm the Associate Dean of Research for the Faculty of Humanities at UVic. I'd like to extend thanks to the Faculty of Social Sciences, uh, which sponsored the talks this fall, and they're organized by the UVic Committee for Urban Studies. This talk is the second of our fall series of three talks on the topic of emergence, <laughs> Victoria's services from the pandemic. We're not fully out yet, but there, there are some interesting conversations to be held about what it means to be stepping away from and stepping through this period that we've lived through. It feels so unprecedented. It is, it feels as though it is, but of course it's not. Pandemics are not new. <laughs> um, and I think that we will hear some really interesting things about the not newness of pandemics this evening. So Mitch Hammond is an assistant professor in the history department at UVic in the Faculty of Humanities. His work has included archival research uh, concerning medicine in German cities during the 16th and 17th centuries. And he also studies in the history of epidemics uh, from the early modern era to the present. His book, Epidemics and the Modern World, was published by the University of Toronto Press in 2020. Uh, and if you pay attention to the press, then you won't be meeting Mitch for the first time tonight. Uh, I have never seen a faculty member receive so much media attention uh, in such a short period. Uh, and Mitch has really done the university and the faculty proud, uh, uh, appearing in local, uh, national, and international uh, radio, uh, digital, and print media. Um, his current project with the working title Medicine in the Modern World is also under contract with the University of Toronto Press, so there's much more to come from Mitch, and I'm really thrilled to be able to introduce him tonight. So thank you very much. Well, thank you all very much, and, and can you hear me, or should I uh, boost the microphone up a bit? Okay. Okay, fantastic. Well, thank you all very much for coming. Um, it's, uh, it's wonderful to be in a, in a non-virtual gathering, and it's, it's wonderful to know that this event will not be Zoom-bombed, <laughs> which uh, I, I saw for the first time yesterday, and it's, it's really something else. Uh, but we don't have to worry about that. Uh, I'd also like to, to thank Alex for the kind introduction, and also the uh, City Talks staff uh, for the generous invitation and for, for organizing uh, the event tonight. So uh, my topic, uh, Epidemic Histories and Pandemic Futures, um, it's uh, obviously a, a topic that uh, has been top of mind in various ways uh, uh, for, for people, for, for people uh, all, all year long and, and, and more. And uh, so I just want to preface what I have to say by, um, I, I guess, just sort of gesturing to the fact that, that for, for historians, um, as well as many other folks, but for historians in particular, um, uh, COVID and the, the outbreak of COVID in the spring of 2020 um, was, a, was a really uh, humbling experience. Uh, there was an initial eagerness on the part uh, of some of us to try and contribute with uh, notional ideas about social context or historical perspective, but um, very quickly underneath it all, there was a nagging sensation that our our, our methods and our perspectives were, were not up to the job. And this was the conversation that was being very actively uh, carried out by my, among, my, among my colleagues. Um, some people suggested that yes, this was a valuable time to, to discuss some of the permanent themes uh, with respect to uh, humans and their engagement with diseases and the natural and the social world. Others uh, suggested that this was a time to to dispense with uh, analogies that were imprecise and perhaps unhelpful, and that we should simply acknowledge our limitations uh, in the face of something that was uh, that was really un unprecedented. And so, uh, historians, I, I, I think, have have muddled through, but I think our sense of, of the novelty 
of, uh, of what we're going through has, has only deepened, I think, as we, as we continue on into uh, rather uncharted territory in many different ways with our, our ongoing experience of, uh, of, the, of the pandemic. And I, I personally am reminded of a, of a joke that uh, Garrison uh, Keeler, a comparison that he draws between the Minnesota winter and uh, a dinner guest that has overstayed the welcome. Um, everyone else is jangling their keys, ready to go, but the pandemic always has one more story to tell. And that seems to be the case, that uh, it's an inexhaustible <laughs> reservoir of, of novelty, often unwelcome novelty for us as we, as we navigate new terrains, new technologies and relationships and so forth. So uh, I cannot uh, have, the, some, have the same vantage point or the same sort of position in front of you that historians sometimes have, because we're all living through this together. Um, it's silly to pretend otherwise. And so all I, all I can try to do is, is sort of walk through uh, some ideas that I think in various ways have probably occurred to one or, one or more of you all along the way, all year long, and just thinking about them together and having a conversation about, uh, uh, in particular, uh, epidemic diseases and their, um, and their intertwining relationships with cities in the past, and to consider how, in some respects, uh, our, our past and our thousands of years experience with diseases in urban life, it gives us resources, uh, gives us perspectives, gives us a repertoire of actions that, that are helpful individually and collectively. But there are also ways that uh, our uh, experience, uh, mostly with, with epidemics, also has primed us to respond in certain ways that create challenges for us with our, with our current uh, pandemic um, experience in our pandemic future. And so I, in the title of this talk, talk uh, Epidemic Histories and Pandemic Futures, self-consciously kind of reference the distinction between these two sort of events, um, and uh, I'll be developing that uh, as, as we go along here. But first I want to start with, uh, with, with a little bit of reflection about, about the words we use, and in particular the, uh, the word epidemic and the idea of an epidemic which of course goes back to, uh, goes back to distant antiquity. Uh, but don't be alarmed, I'm not an ancient historian. So you're not gonna be subjected to, uh, to, to a lot of uh, ancient history and etymology for me. But, but we're gonna start there just a little bit. But the idea of epidemic, very old and has changed over time. Uh, in earliest times, the word epidemic was not directly connected to disease at all. Uh, in the some hundreds BCE, 700, 800 BCE, the word referred to general phenomena, simply meaning uh, in, the, in the bringing together of two, of two units, uh, uh, the, the uh, prefix epi, meaning uh, a cognate idea of upon or among, and, and the Greek word for, for demos, uh, the, the people, origin of course of demography, democracy, and so forth. So, uh, it was simply an event that was upon or among the people and further conveying a connotation or a sense of something or someone that is back home in his country, something that is somehow resident or embedded in one's sort of everyday life. And it had this connotation apart from, as best we can tell, any, any reference to diseases at all. And then, uh, in the in, in the uh, uh, fifth century before Common Era, so going on 2,500 years ago, um, several people wrote uh, texts uh, with the title Epidemics. Not just one person, although we sometimes, we do think of Hippocrates as a person. He is referred to as a person by some ancient writers. So Hippocrates was, it's not unlikely that he was a thing. Uh, he was a person as well as a thing, but more broadly, Hippocrates is kind of a reference to uh, a, an assembly of related texts that coalesce over time into a body of work, the Hippocratic Corpus. And one of the best known of these um, uh, uh, collections of texts, especially after the 16th century when they were recovered in, in, in Western reckoning, were these epidemics, descriptions of maladies that seem to be typical of various seasons or regions. And 
And again, the, the sort of uh, working definition from people who are better versed in this than me is that which circulates and propagates in a country. Now we can consider how this differs from our notion of an epidemic. And I'm going to explore this as we go along, but our notion of an epidemic is more of an episode, something that is epiphenomenal, something that has a start and has a finish. That wasn't the initial understanding of the term. In fact, the, the word epidemic, as, as, it was, as it originated, had more in common with our use of the word endemic something that is somehow embedded into the fabric of a society or of a, of a region or an ecosystem. Okay, so, so these two words, and they remain somewhat, somewhat slippery and imprecise today, but all the more so when we consider this, this ancient etymology. But then much later, by the European 17th century, versions of the term epidemic, variously translated into different, different languages, came into use to describe outbreaks of disease in particular locations. And it was also only then that the term pandemic and related terms come into use to describe disease. Pandemic also had an ancient origin, um, used uh, again to refer to something that was omnipresent or generally characteristic, not in reference to disease, not then used with respect to disease in antiquity, as far as we know. This was an artifact of a much later time. And uh, then, in this time of the 16th and the 17th century, a time of classical revival, of, of revival of, of, of ancient uh, Greek concepts and, and linguistic turns of phrase, it was also at this time that there were uh, a very frequent civic experiences of, of uh, disease outbreaks, epidemics of plague or of typhus or of uh, the disease referred back then uh, to as the, the great pox, a disease that was akin to the disease we now know of as syphilis. Uh, and eventually then also cholera shaped the conception of cities in the face of plague. These were some of the main sorts of most salient epidemic diseases, by no means uh, the only diseases and in many cases not the most important diseases for, for sweeping away people's health and, and lives. But these were the ones that were salient and that became referred to as, as epidemics and which shaped our conception of what an epidemic is. So if we're going to talk about, uh, about the Greeks, we're not going to get away with uh, avoiding Thucydides. Thucydides, the author of uh, the famous work, The Peloponnesian War, uh, uh, reflecting uh, as he was an exiled uh, Athenian military man uh, of some substance, some, some people call him a general, um, reflecting uh, on this, uh, this long-running on-again, off-again conflict between Athens and Sparta. And one of the most salient events in that conflict was uh, an, an epidemic that uh, struck the city of Athens uh, rather early on in the conflict as the Spartans, who had superior land forces, basically chased uh, the, uh, the Athenians out of the neighboring region of Attica. And uh, then this, this disease, and Thucydides actually used the word gnosis rather than, than, than epidemics. Um, uh, he recorded, though, uh, extremely, and to later historians, disarmingly precise uh, signs of disease, uh, uh, a meticulous clinical uh, description of disease. Uh, but he also described it as, uh, as an existential crisis for, the, for the, the health of the, of the body politic, referring to it as a, as, a, as, a, as a scourge that had broken out previously in many other places, uh, but there was no precedent uh, in, the, in terms of the, great, the greatness of this pestilence and the, the destruction it brought. Um, whether or not there was a precedent, hard to say. This is certainly a, has, a, has a trope uh, a, a function as well. The doctors, unable to cope, he said treating this disease for the first time in ignorance, and the more they came into contact with sufferers, the more liable they were to lose their own lives. No other device of men was of any help. He also refers to the abandonment of, uh, of rituals and of, uh, of uh, spiritual obligations, and eventually a, a kind of breakdown of, of social mores with the bodies of the dead and dying. They were piled on one another. 
people at the point of death reeled about the streets, and as people did not know what would become of them, they tended to neglect the sacred and the secular alike. Now this, uh, and it's, it's difficult to chart exactly, exactly when people are imitating Thucydides and when people are imitating other people who had already imitated Thucydides and they didn't read it, they're doing it indirectly. But it's pretty clear that from the early modern period, this, this trope of uh, a disease that, uh, th that creates this kind of existential crisis, this was something that, that became woven into uh, narrative frameworks for, uh, for European communities time and time again. To the point that uh, early modern observers, so starting in the 14th, 15th, and 16th centuries, they depicted epidemics then as episodes that followed a characteristic arc. Initial harbingers uh, of, uh, of, uh, of suffering, harbingers of, uh, of, of uh, you know, uh, apocalypse or calamity, followed by an escalating rise in cases, followed then by consultations from the, the experts who are, who are either inept or impotent in the face of this, um, a complete breakdown of social order, and then the disease of itself, not because of human actions, but the disease of itself fades, leading behind a period of sober reckoning. And this story of this arc is told in, in chronicles and then later on, of course, by historians, time and time again. And that, that, is the, that is the arc and the narrative that in many respects I think we still live with here in the 21st century in spite of all the very different things that, that we also experience along the way. So let me just talk uh, for uh, a minute and explore and pull out a little bit of the salient characteristics of what we might call this epidemic narrative. There are different ways to tell this story, different things that can be emphasized in the epidemic narrative. It is possible, for example, to, to show the display of human communities in the face of ultimate forces. Diseases are a story about humans in the face of those things that they do not control. And of course, in, in late medieval, early modern Europe, this is uh, an, an occasion to reflect on the ultimate power uh, of God, both in terms of God's absolute sovereignty over, over human life, sometimes also uh, God's working through the natural world, on occasion also God's provision of medicine uh, in the natural world, and that this is an example of divine providence as well as divine omnipotence. It's an interesting interplay uh, in, in religious writings on, on, those, on those two themes. So I've, I've, uh, I've included here the, the very famous image of Saint Sebastian intervening for the plague stricken. And you can see here how, how central the city is as the, as the arena in which this, this drama is being played out. It's, it's a literal frame. And it goes beyond just being a place where, where stuff happens. It's a frame for people who are engaged in their collective actions. Uh, it is a frame also that uh, uh, above which there is this intercessory action uh, of the saint on behalf of the community, inter intervening on behalf of this community. Saint Sebastian, known for centuries as the patron saint of those suffering uh, uh, from, uh, from plague. Um, and then below uh, the saint and uh, and God, and it's a bit. It's. it's uh, I'm sorry if the uh, if the uh, lighting does not cooperate very well. But there's an angel and a, and a and a demon underneath those two, and they are competing for a tiny figure that you can't see there, a a, a corpse that's lying directly below the demon. And if you look at the at the way that the that the visual. Um, if you look at the plane of it and, and the, the line that, is, that can be drawn, there's more or less a direct line between that space, between God and Sebastian. You go straight down and you get to the person who's lying in the street. And uh, I, I have focused there, and you can see there the, uh, the close-up on the right, the, the person in dire distress, he's got a, he's got a view bow on his neck. Uh, and so, so if this were a different kind of talk and I were a different kind of historian, one could elaborate perhaps on how the actual physical, visible symptoms that we associate with bubonic plague uh, are, are sort of in, in embedded in this. 
And you can see also in this figure on the right how, how the corpses create, create a trail, essentially a pr processional trail. It's kind of like a, a pilgrimage in negative, uh, pilgrimage of dead bodies circulating through the city. So this is one example of how, of how human communities are, are shown in, in reference to the ultimate forces and how, how the, uh, in the reckoning of European cities, the corpus Christianum, or the Christian body, that was a model that many cities aspired to, how this is embodied in this, in this visual depiction of, of, of plague. And here's a, here's, a better, here's a better example there of the, uh, of the trail of bodies leading up to the, to, to the front of the picture. And this then, uh, the, 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 this, this, uh, the, this uh, idea could then be taken and, and pulled into different directions uh, in, in other kinds of, of depictions and reckonings. Uh, alongside thinking about communities uh, in the face of ultimate forces, it was possible also to, to show that humans were revealed in their, in their being as being weak and fallible. That, uh, that, that humans are, are, are not are not up to the task uh, of, or that, that they are that they are kind of confronted with with, with this with this ultimate thing that that is that is showing them to be to be lacking and frail, and uh, uh, ideas of this kind uh, could be could be written as well, and uh, these would then more or less explicitly in some cases refer to Thucydides, as in the case with the with the Netherlandish uh, artist Michiel Spiers in his Plague in an Ancient City, uh, basically a full on. You know, illustration almost of Thucydides' account of the Peloponnesian War. Much the same thing is going on in in this uh, in this image. The image itself is from 1810, but it's the it's the illustration for the uh, the Plague of Florence as described in the Prologue to the Decameron. The Prologue to the Decameron, 1348. Uh, the, these uh, this collection of, of marvelous stories prefaced with. Uh, once again, what historians consider to be a particularly acute and arresting depiction, not just of the physical symptoms of the epidemic, uh, but also the, the social and moral breakdown. Boccaccio, in a very pregnant phrase that was often quoted by chroniclers, Italians picked up on it and repeated it, uh, you know, uh, husbands left their wives. Um, uh, what is even more, dis more uh, distressing is that mothers even left their children. That, that nobody was safe, that, that everyone was, was subject to abandonment. And this trope of abandonment gets played out uh, again and again. And of course, as an artistic trope, here we are, you know, going on four and a half centuries later in the early 19th century, people are still reflecting on it. It's also interesting to me, just as a, just as a sidelight, that, that this, this image and the previous one also foreground figures that are, that are twisted and contorted and naked. And so the loss of clothing is another sign uh, of, a, of a loss of control. So we see that in both of these images, uh, and this one in particular having to do with plague, but then also with cholera. And cholera, um, a, a disease, of course, that, that was um, very uh, frightening in its own right, but in, in the mid-19th century, cholera was uh, understood in, in, uh, in reference to plague. It, it, is, it is during cholera outbreaks that, uh, that the plague outbreak of 1348 got the moniker Black Death. Uh, Black Death was, uh, was a, uh, the title of the German book, Der Schwarze Tod, by J.F.C. Hecker, written in 1832. Not coincidentally, uh, the time of uh, one of the first great cholera outbreaks in, in, in Europe. And you see, once again, we have, uh, we have our figures in the sky naked and contorted. Uh, Paris, the landscape of Paris, uh, lying uh, inert uh, against, against this plague. So, so there's, a, there's a real play of, of ideas across the centuries reflecting on, on, on antiquity, reflecting also on this idea that humans are fallible and frail. And that's another way that this, that this narrative is, it is told. A third way that uh, epidemics could be engaged with respect to cities was to consider, to, to consider them in terms of the tensions among different classes and social groups. And here's a, here's a lovely, uh, a, a, well, I shouldn't yeah, betray, I've been doing this too long when I refer to images like this as lovely. Um, here's a, here's a, you know, a, a, a really um, telling image of San Francisco's three graces, 
the three graces, we still can't get, we can't get rid of, we couldn't get rid of uh, classical antiquity if we tried, right? It's still there. Um, but here, the three graces have been inverted to, to be skeletons, representing uh, uh, left to right malaria, smallpox, and leprosy, hovering over this, this city landscape. And uh, I'll just briefly uh, show you the, the detail of that, of that landscape. And here, there are the particular, um, particular uh, sites and, and particular um, you know, landmarks of the city environment. We have, uh, on, on the left, we have Butcher Town. We have, to the right, Chinatown. And of course, the, the, the loaded sig signification there of racism, the fear of outsiders, the fear of of the, the, the economic and sanitary incursions of people who are different. Um, in the middle, uh, less distinct, we have the 26th Street Hospital. And here, we have the ship Alton Hour. And the ship Alton Hour was, was a ship that only, that only a few years previous had come into port, and one of the Chinese passengers in steerage had had smallpox. And so that, so that all of the people on that ship were, were forcibly confined uh, for a period. And of course, uh, Canada had a very disappointing episode, very similar to the Komagata Maru uh, uh, episode uh, later on. And so, so this, is, this is another way uh, that, that, uh, that epidemics and cities can be, you know, can, can be intertwined. It's thinking about what this shows us about, about the internal conflicts or the, the unresolved uh, uh, challenges uh, between, with class and race that we have within our city. And so then the disease, although it comes from outside, it's also a cipher. It also shows us what it is about ourselves that, that we've been uh, avoiding looking at. And, uh, and of course, it you know, goes without saying by now that, that historians uh, have reinforced this pattern. Because historians have used this, uh, you know, applying a critical veneer of using epidemics as, as laboratories to study communities under pressure. Once again, trading off on this idea that here we have an episode. Here we have something that has a beginning, a middle, and an end. Uh, lots of action in between. And therefore, it is an ideal sort of subject for analysis. Uh, and because that's one thing that historians always need is that, you know, or it's really helpful to have anyway, is a beginning and an end. It's like, oh great, you know, I can stop reading at, at such and such a year because the epidemic is over, or at least I shift my, my frame of analysis. And so, so historians have shown, and to very good effect, you know, with some very interesting and illuminating studies, how they've shown how epidemics reveal and heighten social tensions, how, how they engender patterns of blaming and stigma. Um, historians have shown how, how the discussion of causes, how people in a certain time and place um, explain epidemics, this discussion of causes illuminates the fundamental assumptions in the in a world. It shows, shows people your worldview in miniature. It shows you the fundamental cosmological or scientific assumptions that are at work in the community. And when there are successive ap epidemics, well, you can, you can trace, trace the changes. Um, it reveals, of course, social and economic relationships and power dynamics, who's in charge and who's not, how and why certain decisions are made. And also, in more recent scholarship, uh, reveals the relationship between communities um, and, and, and the conflicts, uh, you know, warfare and so on, and also the, the, the fraught relationship with ecosystems, how, uh, how human incursions into the natural world, um, manipulation of landscapes, um, changing plants and animals, how, how these things then um, have reciprocal actions both for nature and for lived experiences within the city. So in all of these different ways, we, we can think about how, how epidemics um, from the early modern era forward are, are a, a rich ground of, of narrative. They show us different stories, or at least they can be, they can be harnessed to provide different kinds of, of illuminating stories. But of course, epidemics aren't aren't just about stories. Um, it's also about, uh, it's also about uh, people's experiences and, and what is actually done, uh, the, the, the energies that are, that are expended, the disruptions, and the measures that are taken in order to try and, um, 
you know, bring these bring the suffering to a halt. And this is part of the part of the epidemic experience that we've inherited as well. And so I'll now turn turn uh, to talk about some of the different measures that are undertaken and how those have sort of uh, worked their way through uh, history a little bit. Um, isolation, figuring out who's sick and, and setting them off to the side. The earliest thing that was done, uh, quarantine measures against plague and, and other diseases. This began in Mediterranean port cities. Um, uh, people were doing it uh, unofficially at a municipal level already in 1348. Um, but it began to be more, uh, uh, more uh, meticulously done and done in a more ongoing way in Mediterranean port cities in the later 14th century. Um, and Venice's old la Lazzaretto, uh, illustrated here, which was built in 1428, is a, is a relatively well-known example of what was a very common urban structure. Every port city had a, had a version of this, th this kind of thing. Uh, Venice was, was lucky because they had a bunch of islands that they could use on the, on the outside of their lagoon, and they eventually used three different islands uh, for, for different kinds of quarantine. They had a Lazzaretto Vecchio and a Lazzaretto Nuovo, and then they had a third one that was neither, neither old nor new. Um, and so by the later 16th century then, uh, it was the port cities first and the Mediterranean cities first of all. But then later on, many landlocked cities as well also had houses or barracks uh, for, for isolation on, on, on the edge of town, so just outside the city walls. And this also facilitated extra, extramural burial, which was something that also uh, was routinely done uh, for people with pestilential disease of various kinds, but also a very fraught issue because no one wanted their loved ones to be, to be buried outside the circle. Alongside that, uh, in, in terms of, uh, of treatments, even for plague, yes, there were. Um, not, not successful uh, according to the criteria that, that we have today, but not necessarily to, to be dismissed either. Um, by the, by the mid-16th century, uh, lots of uh, medical manuals had various kinds of, uh, of remedies that would, that, that, would be, um, that, that would be employed. Often they involved some kind of alcohol, so you know, if you can't if you can't cure, you can at least uh, you can at least dull the senses a bit. Uh, but also, different kinds of herbs uh, uh, were were used and, and deployed often with with honey to make it go down a bit uh, a bit easier. And and also, uh, perhaps not bloodletting as one might think uh, in the Middle Ages. One always thinks of bloodletting, and you know that didn't necessarily assume the first rank for plague care. But uh, Lansing Bubo certainly did this idea of expelling the poison getting rid of the poison. This was something that was done. And different kinds of preservatives and remedies and medications, they were repeated on down through the ages. And I, I particularly like this one here because this is a, this is a, uh, a late, late, seven, late 16th, early 17th century, I guess it's late 16th century manuscript, um, a German one. But it, it, it invokes uh, in the top line a good preservative against the pestilence that was used in England in 1348. Well, if it's been around that long, it must be worth something. Okay, that pretty much sums up one aspect of the, the medieval approach and the early modern approach to knowledge. Somebody used it. Uh, es ist probatum. It, it is proven. One, one wonders what, it, what that meant, but often that term was invoked. Now, I, now I, I'm talking about treatment here because this, this, leads, this, this is something that was undertaken not just by individual doctors and sort of on the, uh, in individual relationships, but this was done by cities. And this, by the, by the mid-17th century, the, the giving of medications could even be a source of pride and civic identity for cities. And I'd like to show you a, a brief example of that here, a city where I've spent a good bit of time, the city of Augsburg, uh, now it's a medium-sized place, so rather unremarkable, but in the late 16th century, it was a trading center of European stature um, uh, on the order of, of, of uh, you know, it was actually quite a, quite a bit more of a deal than, than London, although London was going to uh, jump by leaps and bounds. Uh, but Augsburg was a, was a trading center of European stature. It had a very wealthy, noble oligarchy. And by the early 17th century, after successive waves of of plague and other pestilential disease, the city had developed, uh, uh, you know, a relatively, uh, relatively, uh, you know, consistent and, uh, you know, well-oiled machine with respect to what you did. 
when you had an epidemic. The first thing you did was deny it. <laughs> deny it as long as you can. This is a merchant city, after all. But, uh, but, but thereafter, once, the, once it was acknowledged, uh, the, once the, the chain of events had progressed to a certain point, a train of measures was set in motion, uh, including the isolation I spoke of, uh, but also including lots of other measures as well. And this was considered so important that, that the importance of this activity was made visible in what was the city's marquee representation of itself. And that's what I have here, the city's representation of itself, at least from the oligarchic standpoint, Augsburg's Golden Hall, the ceiling of the city hall. And it looks that way today. It's been loved and beautifully restored. It was an expression of civic values, uh, essentially a time capsule for, for uh, civic sentiment for the early 17th century. This program was designed in 1612. And one of the rondules on that, on that gold uh, festooned ceiling is the rondule, again, of one of our, one of our graces or one of our, one of our ancient uh, uh, fem feminine uh, gestures to, to divine power, Procul Parcae, may death be held at bay. And this fresco that included this rondule, this woman holding a caduceus, that's the, the insignia of the physician, in her, in, in her left hand, but then also uh, flanked behind her with, uh, with rows of flasks and vials. Those are the, the flasks and vials of an apothecary shop. She's in, she's in the shop, ready to dispense the medications. And this, this, uh, this fresco was designed the year after one of the larger plague outbreaks experienced in the city in, in 1611. And, and during that year, the city's poor relief office had distributed medicines worth thousands of gulden to poor city residents. They uh, also sheltered people in the plague house. Some hundreds of people were in the plague house. They also uh, uh, dispatched or uh, uh, recruited neighborhood chiefs, um, men of good character, who were supposed to report and conduct surveillance uh, on the city. They had over 80 of these. Um, Apothecary shops had contracts, barber surgeons and physicians and the whole bit had contracts. There was a comprehensive medical system that had evolved in this city, not just because of epidemic diseases, but that was certainly one of the important components of its poor relief scheme. And by the early 17th century, medical poor relief uh, during epidemics and in general was one of Augsburg's largest expenses. Is second only to food for its provisions to the poor. And the protection of health was then accepted as a key responsibility of this oligarchic elite. It was something that you did for your city, something that you did for your community. And it was this, it was this ethos that then was also taken up into ever larger administrative and governing units with regional and territorial states within the Holy Roman Empire, the Bonne Vie in, in France, but also regional, uh, you know, provincial, uh, provincial structures and ultimately national structures. So this is a value of looking after your neighbor in this way that, that took shape, I would say, in, an, in important respects at the municipal level. Now, in addition to isolation and treatment and, and medications, uh, uh, over time, uh, uh, city, city officials and other, other uh, informed observers conducted surveillance and counting and began to develop comprehensive systems uh, of, 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 of medical surveillance. And I simply have included here one, uh, one of the earliest texts, the Politia Medica, uh, published first in Latin and then later on in German, which outlined a comprehensive approach to physicians, midwives, hospitals, apothecaries, uh, and, and also figuring out what to do with illegal practitioners, which you know everybody said they should just be kicked out of town and thrown out on their ear if they, if they weren't harshly punished first. Um, and so by the end of the 18th century, one of the, one of the outcomes of this is, is grand enlightenment systems of public health. Johann Peter Frank, late, late 18th century, was best known for one of his you know, multi-volume works for doing this in the German language. There were other, other ones as well. Um, but, but again, it's at the municipal level that you begin to have this thinking about a more systematic incorporation of public health into civic governance. And uh, arguably the best illustration of all of counting are London bills of mortality. And uh, I just happened to pull out one of the, uh, one of the ones from uh, the week of the 15th to the 22nd of August, 1665. 
in which 3,880 people were recorded in London as dying from plague. And um, they had, uh, it'd be interesting to, to see, do, do, we have, do we have better reporting now in the 21st century or not? <laughs> One likes to think we do. Um, but uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's a good bet that uh, they were undercounting then and that we're under, undercounting now, uh, to, sit, to say no more. Um, but uh, this was the fruit of, uh, once again, this uh, long-term engagement in the early modern era with epidemics. And here I want to point again to one of the really interesting aspects of the diseases that I mentioned, plague, typhus, cholera, being sort of foremost among them, smallpox to a degree. These were diseases that were intermittent in their impact. And that was important because you had, you had an episode, you had a chance to see what the problem was, and then it was gone. And you can only figure out what the problem is when you have a gap in between to sort of uh, assess what the changing variables are. Uh, if it's always there, it's like, well, it's always here. Why is it always here? Don't know. It's hard to tell. Um, and so this episodic nature allowed for leaders and other informed observers to analyze patterns of morbidity and mortality, who was getting sick and where, the seasonal occurrences, and also what became important, uh, going back to the quarantine I mentioned at the beginning, the role of shipping in introducing plague, which of course was a, a key consideration for, for, for the city of London. And so the episodic nature of plague outbreaks, not just an aspect of narrative, an, a, an aspect also of lived experience, shaping the measures that were eventually taken against it. And we can readily contrast this with other diseases that had a more permanent, uh, sort of achieved a kind of fixture uh, status, uh, such as tuberculosis in the 19th century, has very different cultural resonances for that reason. So, um, as, as modern, uh, as modern uh, life, industrial processes, and larger scale uh, uh, projects uh, became more of a, re of a reality, in addition to the, to the factors I mentioned, also by the, by the mid-19th century, one of the key focuses, especially for cholera, was water infrastructure. And here is a famous image, uh, which was uh, a map uh, done by John Snow, a well-known uh, physician, uh, considered by some to be the, the father of, of uh, medical, uh, or the father of epidemiology, uh, the father of a strategic use of, uh, of map-based uh, statistical thinking. Um, it's important, I would say, to recognize that, that he was working within what was already a well-developed tradition, especially in, in uh, early 19th century uh, England, a tradition of public health mapping. His, his work was, you know, an, an, in, an incremental advance or really just a, just a variation on a, on a well-developed theme. Um, Snow's efforts also, um, they're, they're, it's, it's given all sorts of, uh, of, of kudos um, that in some cases just simply, you know, smart guy, very smart guy, but just not deserved. Um, his efforts did not really stop the cholera outbreak, um, nor were his claims sufficient on their own to persuade city officials that contaminated water was the only source of cholera. That was the, that was the nub of the disagreement in the mid-19th century with respect to cholera. Yeah, okay, it might be in the water, but how did it get into the water, huh? So I bet it came from the air first. So there was this, there were all manner of uh, elaborate explanations of, of how, different, uh, how different parts of the landscape were implicated in cholera, and every, you know, air, uh, land and uh, and water all had their partisans, right? In terms of what what the original locus of infection was. However, water infrastructure was key for uh, for stopping cholera, and this became ever more clear as the 19th century progressed. And by the late 1860s, so 15 years or so after this map, the value of improved water infrastructure was broadly accepted even if the exact causes of contamination were still in doubt. And here, just as I showed you one depiction of the city of Augsburg with its uh, sort of self-presentation, here's another, here's another emblem of, uh, in this case, uh, Britannia, 
the, 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 the Lady of Britain, but who, who here also takes the place of the city of London. And uh, uh, the city of London is, is uh, being introduced here to, to offspring, including, including cholera there on the far right, but then also scrofula, uh, the, 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 the smaller figure there in the middle. And then the one that appears to be choking is diphtheria. Which was a which was a, an, another disease that uh, that people worried about and worried about even more by the end of the nineteenth century. So th this shows us once again the personification of the city with respect to this whole issue. Of what are we going to do about the water supply? It's it, it, the, the Thames has stunk to high heaven for decades. What do we make of that? Um, so it's true that by by the time of this of this cartoon. Uh, contaminated water, again, increasingly suspected as a source of disease, even though there continued to be, for some years, debate about this. Debate that is going to reach a critical juncture in just a few decades with the work, uh, uh, um, in important respects, of this man, Hermann Robert Koch, um, who was, uh, who was uh, responsible for um, we're talking about narratives before, he's, he was responsible for creating a narrative of his own a very persuasive account of how uh, disease infection takes place. Understanding the etiology of several of the most uh, devastating diseases of his time. The, the uh, cattle disease that occasionally infected humans, anthrax, which was where his work started. Also uh, tuberculosis, uh, acknowledged at that time as the greatest killer of people, not the most dramatic, but the greatest killer of people. Um, uh, Koch, with his microscope, was able, and his, and his entire team, able to stain and use stains in order to discern uh, the, the, the tu tuberculosis bacilli, and to show that the tuberculosis bacilli were present in different parts of the body, and so that diseases that previously had been considered distinct, scrofula, spinal tuberculosis, pulmonary tuberculosis, these were all, in fact, manifestations of the same infection throughout the body. And so, so understanding disease in a different way, uh, I, I throw the SARS-CoV-2 micrograph in there because I think in important respects, this is still the conceptual world that we live in. Not saying it hasn't advanced and changed in important respects, of course it has. But, uh, but we're still living with that model of infectious microbes. So uh, this similarly had an impact on people's perspective on cholera, because uh, the year after he uh, gained global acclaim for isolating the uh, tubercul uh, bacillus, tuberculosis bacillus, uh, there was a cholera outbreak in Egypt. And this was bad news, because uh, Egypt was right next to the Suez Canal, which had just opened uh, in 1876, so not, not even 10 years before. So bad news for the Suez Canal was bad news for a lot of wealthy people in England and elsewhere. And so public health officials hustled over to, to uh, Port City of uh, Demita. And uh, from there, the Germans went on to India because everybody knew uh, from earlier times that India was a likely source of, of cholera. And so, so Coach, depicted there third from the right, um, he, and his, he and his team uh, were, were able to, to make a persuasive case, not an airtight case, but a persuasive case, that cholera was also caused by a bacillus. And I also like just, just throwing up this image of, you know, here we, have our, here we have our explorers, right? We have our microbe hunters, as such men were, were, were later called. You know, they're out there on safari with their pith helmets out there in the, in the tropics, right? And in another talk, we could, we could go, we could discuss this at, at greater length, but we won't. Um, so, so Coach, as, as I mentioned, uh, his case was good, but it wasn't airtight. He wasn't able to go through certain steps that, uh, that he himself had, had asserted were necessary to go through in order to prove causal links. Um, couldn't go through, you know, uh, isolating it and creating another, you know, infecting another animal, going through what we now refer to as coaches' postulates, although they've changed over time. We call them coaches' criteria or coaches' postulates for this kind of proof. Um, some people said, well, look, you haven't even fulfilled your own postulates. How can you be sure about this? 
Nobody wanted to, to close the, the, the Suez Canal. Nobody wanted to, or some people didn't want to admit that soil rather than water wasn't the cause of cholera. Um, even though water was widely acknowledged as a source, there were expert holdouts. And because there were expert holdouts, as we know in our world, it only takes one expert holdout to create political inertia. <laughs> and so it was the case in the 1880s and early, 19, early 1890s. Uh, some cities decided not to improve their water infrastructure. And tragically, one of those cities was the North German port of Hamburg. So Hamburg had the last great outbreak of cholera in Europe in uh, 1892, uh, estimated uh, on the order of 8,000 people died. So uh, a, 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 a tremendous blow uh, uh, to, this, to this city. And, uh, and what had happened, uh, the, the, the history of this, be beautifully told by historian Richard Evans, um, the history of this was important. Uh, lots of it, inhabitants of, uh, of Hamburg, uh, lower class inhabitants who lived near, near the ocean, had essentially been kicked out of their neighborhood because the city wanted to, to create uh, what, what was agreed upon to be a duty-free zone that essentially they could have kind of a, kind of a tax haven of sorts, tax haven on the Elbe. Uh, and, and this was owed to the dynamics within Within the uh, you know their their relationship with Prussia that was uh, on its way towards creating a German a German state, but Hamburg wanted to have these special privileges and hold on to them as it, as it had since the late Middle Ages, and so so uh, so Prussia said, well, fine, you can have your port, but you have to create a zone. You got to have a new port. So uh, the Hamburg merchants said, okay, everybody, hop to it. Um, you folks are going to have to move because that's where we want the port. Thank you, and we're going to put it there. So in its rush to finish this port, Ham Hamburg neglected basic sanitation. They didn't do things that other cities had done. And uh, after this devastating outbreak, uh, Robert Koch toured this, uh, toured this neighborhood and his, his verdict on it or, you know, echoed throughout, throughout Germany to their shame. Gentlemen, I forget that I am in Europe. Um, so shame on you, Hamburg's merchants. And so thereafter, the city lost considerable autonomy. It was compelled to improve its water filtration and extend voting rights, extend voting privileges to more, to more people. Governance had to be done differently in Hamburg as a result of this, of this epidemic. It was food, food for thought for us today. It can happen that government change happens when, when, when things get to a certain point. Unfortunately, it had to be really bad uh, for this to happen. So this is a story of cities what happened to Hamburg, but it's also a story of how cities are, are ceding some of their status and some of their autonomy to ever larger regional and national entities that are assuming uh, various kinds of, of, of health measures and, and uh, you know, assuming that part of a civic, uh, a civic consciousness uh, in, in a different way. So, so what happened with, uh, with, with Koch and with the unfolding of various germ theories in the 1880s and 1890s and thereafter, um, this was very important. And I think, as I said before, this is still kind of the world that we're in. It was a new paradigm for infectious disease. And it also expanded the biological and conceptual space for this relatively newish concept of a pandemic. But basically, we have a new set of assumptions, and you can think about these assumptions with respect to how we go about things with COVID today. Living microbes infect people and cause distinctive diseases. And both of those are, are important, the living microbes and the distinctive diseases. A plague bacillus does not cause cholera. Okay? A cholera bacillus does not cause tuberculosis. They have distinct identities. However, in addition, these microbes affect all people around the world in similar ways. And if I had more time, we could talk all about how European uh, scientists went to Africa and used Africa as a kind of laboratory for learning about infectious diseases. And they used African animals to learn about infectious diseases and uh, pioneered some very important concepts and brought them back to Europe. That's another interesting story. But here, we can just rest with the fact that, global, that, that, that the global sort of impact of disease is going to be the same no matter where you are. Variations in the effects of microbes then would depend on the innate qualities and sanitary habits of different peoples and groups. Same microbe, different effects, 
And it's because people behave differently. Some people are more susceptible to some diseases than others. So, that, so even though we have a kind of biological neutrality with respect to microbes, there's still room, ample room for, so for uh, different kinds of social and cultural hierarchies to be enacted because it's all about behavior and sanitation. And then, of course, this gets us in more and more into a vein of, of thinking in terms of pandemics being more of a possibility. There's rapid global transport, steamships, railways, eventually airplanes, enabling the global spread of disease in ways that were impossible before. And then also of great importance for the communal reckoning uh, with, with a pandemic, telegraph, telephone, and radio, enabling this almost instant long distance communication and the concurrent experience of pandemic. And that's something that's intrinsic to some definitions of a pandemic. It has a time element. The simultaneous outbreak or simultaneous manifestation of disease in several distinct places. So we're at the same time. So it's not just that it goes from one place to another. It's this simultaneity. So the emergent germ theories made the individual animal or human, individual people, the basis of investigation and the basis of prevention in the case also of vaccines as well as the basis for treatment and sanitary control. It becomes more and more about people. It's not about dams, it's not about sewers. Those things remain important, but they're not important in quite the same way. Solutions focusing on water quality or uh, public space disinfection, now shared space with instructions that were focused on behavior. And also in the case of malaria, and eventually also the plague and typhus, efforts to kill insect vectors. So vector-borne diseases, that's another detour that we will, we will leave aside. So this is an interesting this is an interesting image because this this all this shows us here um, in 1900 a city that is that is facing a plague literally the bubonic plague in San Francisco but also it it got pulled into these broader jurisdictional tussles uh, between the the state governor of California and uh, the U S Marine Hospital Service and national government what happened was there was an outbreak of uh, outbreak of, uh, uh, of plague as it was deemed to be in Chinatown, a flurry of activity on again, off again, uh, cases of plague for several years in San Francisco. Um, and so this is, this is how it looked uh, from Los Angeles. Hey, you guys in San Francisco, you need to, you need to be the bulwark, right? You need to, your city needs to take this on with uh, the quarantine. So on one hand, we have a civic consciousness, even, even if only indirectly, but uh, in, in practice, what happened was that uh, the governor of California, who uh, was a partisan of railway politics, um, basically forbade San Francisco from going the whole way with its disinfection and its, its counter disease procedures. And so there was a jurisdictional tussle. So this illustrates how changing sensibilities, um, you know, there's, there are still plenty of power struggles involved, but they're changing because it's ever more larger regional entities. So now let me, and here I'm actually, uh, I have my slides out of order. This is the one I want to show you. Um, just to very briefly refer to um, uh, the relatively swift course of influenza in 1918. So today, in some respects, in terms of the scale of um, the, the, the pandemic that, that we've encountered, um, the pandemic of flu a century ago is, is sort of um, a convenient sort of reckoning point in terms of the the scale of, uh, of suffering and also the, uh, the the fact that its its outward manifestations um, were were had some superficial similarities. You know, they're both respiratory diseases. Um, obviously, the differences are, are quite important as well. Um, but what happened with with the flu in 1918 was that that uh, it it came and went relatively quickly in waves, several waves. And it's coincidence with the end of World War I, which occupied people's attention, this served to mute lots of broad conversations about civic duty and, and public health. And, uh, and, and, so, and so but you can see here from this, uh, this picture that sanitary measures here increasingly are a measure of personal conduct. Okay? It's people doing things you, you know, for, uh, uh, you, you know, on their own. And so to some degree, anything that is a matter of for personal conduct is also uh, a matter of individual choice. Um, and I'll just mention that that's something that we can talk about in the discussion. There's routinely some dissent against any personal measure 
on either ethical or religious grounds. And so the, 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 uh, the resistance uh, that there is in some quarters to vaccines or to masks, uh, other kinds of measures, it's really not all that unusual when you consider the, the history of, of, of such, of such um, things. So now let me, in closing, kind of, kind of fast forward a century hence. We had a century where in the West, we enjoyed not complete freedom from things such as smallpox or, or polio or even tuberculosis, um, and also the, the gradual increase or resurgence of some of these diseases in the later 20th century, um, uh, and also HIV AIDS. But we didn't have the same kind of, of pandemic as we had in, in 1918. But then we fast forward to 2020, and, and uh, we can now ask the question, where are our cities? What is the, what is the shape of, of cities, or how do cities present to us? And uh, I was looking for city, like how do cities relate, and, and, and what reference, and in what, what posture do cities stand with respect to the, to the pandemic? And a lot of it is empty cities. And that's what we saw, especially last spring. We saw empty cities. We saw cities with, not, with nothing happening because all of the people were, were, were inside. And so this, you know, the, these, these landscapes like this one in Calgary, you know, the world over, people showed lots of cities like this. And this is what our own street looked like, uh, you know, in, in March 2020. I, I was hopeful that this was the actual building, but I don't think it is, the building that we're in. It's certainly very close to them. I think it's, I think it's a block that way. But the other way that cities appear in our, in our reckoning today, and this goes back to that this goes back to that model that was forged with germ theories in the in the in the at the end of the nineteenth century, models uh, of showing the transmission of pathogens and and the counting of cases. Now I showed you some some illustrations of counting going back that predated um, germ theory, um, and uh, you know obvious important differences there. But, but this, this kind of thinking has really loomed very large in our consciousness for the, for the past uh, year plus. And you can find different, different renderings of, of the statistics of, of the incidence rate of morbid, morbidity and mortality um, and visualized in this way. And so this is New York City. And I'm going to show you just because, you know, Victoria doesn't have, at least to my knowledge, Victoria doesn't have a COVID tracker that really you know, fits, the, fits in quite the same way. British Columbia certainly does. Oops, here we go. And so, so here's our dashboard for, uh, for, for, the, uh, for the province. And of course, you can find the Island Health Authority within this, this data. And, but, the, but, but these dashboards, they rely on several premises. The data are available from different places at the same time. They're all simultaneous events. COVID cases can be counted you can determine what's a COVID case and what's not with your test. And you can also compare across regions or even continents. And you can do so simultaneously. There's a, there's a sense of instantaneous availability of this pandemic at your fingertips, even though, as I was discussing just right before the, before the talk, the fact that a lot of this data is, is just, you know, there's, there's just so many issues with how this data is, is actually, what, what's under the hood where this data is concerned. But, but we're still, with these depictions, we're, we're going through, we're, we're going through you know, these statistics and we're still in that, in that framework of infections and, and individual uh, constructions of disease, but now cast in these global terms because of the technology we have. Here's Toronto's dashboard, very, very sophisticated dashboard. And I'll just, I'll just mention, anybody who's a data junkie, you want to check in with the, with the Mumbai COVID-19 response war room dashboard. That's for you. Um, there is more data than you have ever seen. Um, but so, so, you know, this idea that, there, that, that you can track, that you can track COVID, this is an idea that's more or less interchangeable the world over. It's remarkable. Even to the point that um, numerous cities actually use the same software. There are dozens of cities that represent hundreds of millions of lives. They've joined a consortium. They did so for the purposes of HIV AIDS reporting. Uh, but many cities have now added a COVID-19 dashboard. So our cities then, in this respect, there's a kind of interchangeability in the way that we use data. So all of these things, uh, what I'm pointing to is that in our, in our pandemic, our pandemic present and perhaps our pandemic future, this makes us think about cities in a different way. 
It makes us think about, well, how does the city as a, as a corpus stand in relation to these, to these diseases when there are all these forces that relate the individual directly to the universal? That, that the city doesn't have the same sort of, sort of, sort of status, and, I, and I'm, I'm not able really to resolve that or kind of come to another formulation for that. This is where the, the, the humility of the historian makes a small cameo appearance. Um, but but the, the future of disease and, and cities, um, we can look for certain things that might happen and then, and then talk about them more perhaps in the few minutes we have. The greater potential that there are for pandemics or the rapid spread of pathogens. We've got all, all the things now, the ingredients are in place for other diseases to circulate in, in the same way. And there were a few other diseases prior to COVID-19, of course, that followed similar trajectories, but just not on the same scale. We have larger mega cities such as one that doesn't show up because it's actually three cities, and so it escapes your greatest hits list. But uh, the, the largest urban agglomeration on the planet right now is arguably uh, Guangzhou, Dongguang, Shenzhen, which is near, near uh, Hong Kong, basically, the peninsula uh, that's next to Hong Kong Island and then and the parts north, north of that. Population approaching 40 million. So there, there are city agglomerations out there, Tokyo is another one, that, where there's more people in one urban sort of center uh, with its tentacles that, than in all of Canada, right? That one city versus all of Canada. So, so this then creates environmental impacts and, and disease dynamics that, that I think are ultimately, they're, they're impossible to foresee exactly how all this is gonna, gonna work. Then on top of that, we have the mass availability of data, of variable quality. We have social media. Uh, anybody with a phone can look at the trackers that I just showed you and that kind of instantaneousness. That's something that if I had to pick one thing that is, that is utterly novel in our pandemic experience, it's that. It's the simultaneity enabled by the absolute fire hose of data that we carry in our pockets. Um, and so the question about cities and modern life in general, I think that can be raised is what will be the role of, uh, of what we think of as that kind of classic city experience, face-to-face -face interactions. Uh, how will this shape our ideas about individual and corporate responsibility? How do people find their way within the city as well as find their way in, in pandemics in, in this, this giant globe? So that's it. And uh, thank you all for your attention uh, for a rather, for a rather longish talk. I appreciate it. So, yes, sir. Uh, I have several questions, but let me just ask two, maybe, of the three. Uh, the first one is, <clears throat> I mean, is it, is it even conceivable to have had any epidemic or pandemic, let me know, even epidemics before you had cities, before you had urban, you know, creation, right? Because, I mean, humans have been around for 200,000 years, and cities are rather recent, you know, uh, it's Tower and Jericho or something, you know, 8,000 years ago. I mean, it's pretty like yesterday. But I mean, are there any indications in the record, archaeological record, that we've ever had any epidemics before cities came about? Yeah. Well, you, well, you could have, and this is an interesting thing, that, that there's a, some, some, some constructions or some narratives of history say, well, first you had, first you had cities, then you had animals, then you had people and animals and their, their droppings, then you had diseases, then you had epidemics, right? This is a kind of almost developmental model of, 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 of you know, and to some extent, certainly, of course, when you have more people, you have more infections and you have, you have greater mutation rates and so forth. So to some extent, naturally, that, that, that's, that, that's true. Having said that, though, um, some recent research has kind of problematized this kind of, this, the most obvious connections that we have to what we think of as crowd diseases. They emerged in times and places that, that were not necessarily characterized by crowds. Smallpox was, was, was uh, predated cities. Um, tuberculosis, one of the early, one of the oldest diseases uh, rattling around out there. Um, it, uh, there was once a theory that humans contracted uh, tuberculosis from cows because there is a strain of bovine tuberculosis. It's actually the basis for a vaccine, or at least it used to be. Um, but now it seems, it seems that, that cows have humans to thank for tuberculosis rather than the other way around. Um, so so there, there's not, so, and, and it's also true, with, uh, also true with, with malaria in Africa, that this is 
This is not connected in as obvious a way as we might think to, to societies. And so, so, so I, I have to grant your point. Uh, naturally, you know, the scale of things is influenced. But in going back in early history, the, the evolution of diseases is, you know, it's, it's tempting for us to always say that these diseases are the result of human actions, and that there's this grand interplay between humans and microbes. And sure, there is an interplay, but we're also part of an even bigger picture. That, and that bigger picture had a larger role, you know, tens of thousands of years ago. And an epidemic has, requires a spread and a yes, it does. speed yes, it across does. a certain territory, yeah. which you might not have with, I mean, You're, yeah, I mean, malaria, you certainly, yeah. and, that, and that's why, you know, the, the tempo of epidemics and pandemics today can be, can be so much, can be so different. Um, that, so, yes, you're absolutely right. I guess the other question is, the quick one is, you said, you know, they buried people outside of town and nobody wanted that, but curiously, right, the, the Romans, as far as I know, always buried the people outside of the city. Isn't that correct? The, 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 the Romans. Romans. The Romans. Yes. They, they always buried people outside. Oh, the Romans always buried people outside. Oh, well, right? yeah, well, they had, you know, they had their share. Of, right. Okay. Yeah, absolutely. They had their share of epidemic diseases, too. So, yeah, for sure. I have another question if, if nobody has a question. I have a question. <laughs> in terms of the evolution of the city state and the role of cities playing a more prominent role in pandemics, and I'll use the example of um, Alberta, for example. So Edmonton and Calgary became very proactive in terms of their mayors, articulating bylaws and a variety of other uh, policy directions that ran counter to what the province was doing i.e. the province wasn't doing what it should have been doing, and yet the cities were stepping up. Do you see a greater evolution in this kind of trajectory of cities taking much more proactive roles in sort of responding to pandemics and issues related to their jurisdictional areas? Gosh, I'm, I'm not sure I can say, because that, that, that I, I would think that would come down to local government acts, or in D.C. anyway or it would come down to the different regimes that there are. I mean, uh, you, know, health, you know, key aspects of health are provincial concerns. Um, in, in, in Canada, it's, it's, you know, the, the deck is shuffled differently in the United States and then, and then elsewhere. But then the municipalities have their own, have their own you know, prerogatives as well. All, all, all I can say is that, that that's something that people, that people argue about all the time. And then in, in, the, in the United States, for example, that's, that's, you know, there's, there's probably somebody in the Texas legislature sitting here as we speak, <laughs> arguing about, you know, whether or not Austin has, has the ability to impose these things or not. Um, so that then flows into this broader question, I, I guess, of, of, of what the prerogatives are for, 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 for states. And so I can't, uh, I, I can't say for sure. I think that it, it would depend to some degree. I think a lot of these things depend on, on what the shape of the disease is and how it's discerned as spreading. And let's say that there was a waterborne disease that, that you know people isolated uh, cholera-like disease that suddenly was there. And uh, well, then well then how do you how do you manage water supplies that go across provinces and so on? So I think that the my that's just my intuition is that the character of the disease itself would have as much to do with that. And then of course what the the political actors who were involved and how aggressive they are. But yeah, I don't have a real I don't have an easy answer to that. Well, um, so I have another question as to with your uh, tropes. One of the tropes that you showed a picture of was this uh, Saint uh, Lazarus, what's his name? Yes, I, probably Sebastian. Sebastian, the, the yeah, Sebastian yes. yeah uh -huh. curing somebody. Um, and so this, this trope is of an individual having powers, right, over disease. Uh, of, of a disease of an epidemic sort, right? Yeah, well, and just just a quick aside about that. He, he, is, he doesn't have power himself. Uh -huh. He is an intercessor. Uh -huh. And what you, what you saw with him kneeling there, and I'm, I'm, right. sorry, if the, I'm sorry that the, the figure is too small, but St. Sebastian is always depicted with, as being pierced with arrows. Uh -huh. And right. usually, he's, he's very nice, if you're really familiar with Botticelli, what have you, is he's you know, these beautiful sort of semi-nude males with a you know, arrow in their sight. 
Um, that, that kneeling figure is actually a bit of a pincushion, that little guy. Um, but but there, there's, you know, with arrow, pierced with arrows. But, but the saints weren't there to heal themselves. Mm -hmm. They were there as intercessors on behalf to say to say to say, say, say to God, you know, hey God, look, look at this, these folks here, and to to intercede on behalf of the community. So I don't know if that if that sure influences that's, your question. No, no, that's that's uh, fits perfectly, right? I mean, they're kind of shamans, let's say, they're transmitters of power, right? They have magical powers because somebody else gives them to them, right? But so, I mean, it was I was struck by your by the beginning of your account, you went far back, but you went to Thucydides, instead of going to the Ilias, the Ilia, I I, Iliad, 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 right, in English, yeah, uh, because I've, I've always been struck at the beginning of the, the, their, their trip to Troy, right, gets interrupted in an awful way because they decide to assault the city and uh, bring on all the loot and uh, the girls, right, and this guy takes the girl he likes, uh, the great hero of his, right? And uh, 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 takes the, make, makes a mistake, takes the, the daughter of the priest of Apollo, That's and uh, wow, what happens to these poor warriors? They all get this disease, right? And they can't get rid of it until they do the right thing, which is give her back, right? So, so by the way, I mean, they're a bit of distance, it's that wonder worker, but through intelligence, right? So, well, you just gotta do that, right? And another case is, uh, the Optima, if I recall correctly, the, the, which? the Optima, the, the, the woman who tells the story of love in the symposium, okay. and you know she's, you know supposedly one of her of her great things that she has done that she's famous for is that she uh, cured the, the or saved Athens from the plague, or some plague at you know at some point in history, I mean in time, right, which is all kind of half mythical, but. I mean, so you've got two cases of wonder workers, right? Long before Saint Sebastian, right? This is an interesting trope. Just yeah, yeah, and, it's, uh, and I, I pulled out the, the Thucydides because it's such an obvious right. model for, 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 for later things. Right. But, but yeah, for, for, for sure, I mean, in the Iliad, you know, the, all of that, the, the, the tension between Agamemnon and, and, uh, and, and Achilles, and that, 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 that the disease is a, is a driver, right. the disease is a, is a driver of the action. It, Tells things forward, so it serves a it serves a, a dramatic, you know, purpose for that for that oral re retelling. And as 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 the as the pandemic or sorry the, the the plague of Athens served a dramatic purpose for Thucydides as well. Right before that, uh, right before Thucydides' account of the plague, he has a speech by Pericles. Mm. So Pericles is the leader of you know this, this Athenian city state, extolling the virtues of, of Athens after the first year of the Peloponnesian War. Look how great we are! Look how brave we are! We have this cosmopolitan vitality, and so on. Um, and then the very next chapter, boom! It came from Lemnos, and all hell broke loose. Mm. And this is this is this this general in exile who is sort of in, obliquely comment, commenting. On the, the the fallen, you know, the moral turpitude of an Athenian city-state that is turned away from its values. Mm -hmm. Pericles himself dies from the plague, and you have this 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 awful attempt to reconcile democracy and empire. Mm -hmm. And the city is shaking his head, like, no, this is never going to work, right? Mm -hmm. and, and so so you're so you're absolutely right. You know, these, these plays they, they they motivate actions, and uh, yeah, it's like you know, and, and the Bible too. You know, I mean, you, you've got you know these. Could could easily have, have gone have discussed Bibles as well, but Thucydides, you know, he, he creates a, he creates a certain cityscape, and that cityscape is is something that then gets that then gets kind of inserted in, in interesting ways into, mm -hmm. into later traditions. Right, right. I have a question. I really enjoyed your talk, and yeah. um, I guess many of the examples you gave uh, about the history of disease um, are European cities or within the European context, and I was wondering how that relates to kind of a broader global history of, of disease and, and, and the city in terms of you know, other geographic regions like you know, China and, and you mentioned Africa, but in, you know, that came into, the, in, into your narrative in relation to kind of Europeans discovering, you know, making certain epidemiological discoveries and so on. But, um, but I, I was wondering if you could maybe situate your talk within that broader global um, context of, of disease. Yeah. 
Well, yeah, it gets, um, yeah, th this, this is where, you know, historians have, have, have plowed their furrow, and some furrows are plowed better than others, and that's a problem we have. But, 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 a but absolutely, I mean, I mean with, with respect to, you know, with respect to, 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 to Chinese history, the, 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 uh, and also there's a, a scholar named Michael Mann, Who's, who's written this written this great book about uh, about plague in in Hanoi, and and a lot a lot of what happens and this this, this is actually just going to illustrate the illustrate the failings is that a lot of the a lot of the we can call it epidemic narratives or epidemic stories that are told by historians investigating other places they're ultimately meditations on on you know attempting to be nuanced but med meditations on colonialism. And so, and so the you know this plague outbreak that I referred to happening in um, in San Francisco, you know, reciprocal thing happening in in uh, in, uh, in Vietnam, in uh, oh, it's, a site, it's not Saigon, it's uh, I forget this Hanoi, of course it's Hanoi. And so and, and so uh, you know they had rat catchers in, in Hanoi and they were attempting to implement this the, the, this French this French colonial system. Um, the the, the you know I don't have I, I don't have time to talk about it at length but 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 the disease that really shows us you know both what can be done and how much more we need to do is is, is discussing AIDS mm -hmm. and and HIV AIDS and the way that that has has impacted impacted African communities the way that the AIDS um, pandemic was figured very differently in North America than it, than it was in 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 Africa mm -hmm. and the way that that continues to to uh, Inform cities in very different ways in, in on the African continent versus versus elsewhere. Um, so, so yeah, that, that, those are those are stories that that are still they're still very fragmented. They're viewed through the prism of of, of, uh, of colonialism often, or the the, the the unempowered or disempowered global South. Um, so so there there are more stories to to to, to tell in that vein for sure. Global Citizens, Solidarity In and Out of a Pandemic, uh, and that's with Dr. Anita Ho from the Center for Applied Ethics at UBC, so we hope you're able to join us for that one as well. Um, and if you're interested, there is a sign-up sheet right here, and it looks as though there are four or five sanitized pens, so you're, if, you're, if you're interested, you can put down your email address to join the listserv for these talks. So thank you very much, and have a lovely evening.